Uh, while we are waiting for the latecomers to fill up the time, I am going to read you uh, two more of the messages sent to Yuval. Uh, I'll hand it to Yuval once he arrives. Uh, one is uh, from Gershon Goldhaber. Um, please convey our best wishes to Yuval and his great on this great occasion. Please also convey my greetings to the people who came to celebrate Yuval's atheists and share my reminiscence with them. Shula and I first met Yuval in 1962 at the Rochester Conference held at CERN that year. Shula and I had tried very hard for several years to find positive strangeness baryonic resonances. At that time, we could not understand why negative strangeness baryonic particles were plentiful, while the others, which looked to us symmetric, did not seem to exist. Luckily, we did not find any pentaquarks if they indeed exist, which would have complicated the understanding of the quark model greatly at that time. In talking to Yuval about the problem, he came back the next day with a possible solution. If the N-stars and the negative strangeness hadrons belonged to a decoplet, there would be no need for positive strangeness baryons. And this could be checked because a triply strange particle would have to exist. Well, as is well known, the following day, Murray Gellman made the same suggestion at the conference, namely that the omega minus should exist. The rest is history. Yuval and Murray in their book called Our Effect, The Gold Harbor Gap. After this dramatic first meeting, I've seen Yuval over the years on many occasions, both happy and sad. I feel a great friendship towards him. I feel very close to him and thankful. Oops, sorry. It happens. Uh, after, uh, where am I? Yeah, I feel very close to him and thankful to the entire Tel Aviv physics department for their efforts of having a yearly memorial lecture for Shula starting in 1966, a year after she died. I'm very sorry I could not be with you on this great occasion. I hope the future occasions will arise at which I will be able to come. Best wishes also to Dvora from Judy and me, Shalom Gershon. So that was Gershon Goldhaber. And a short uh, message from Lev Okun. Uh, could you please give my warmest greetings, congratulations, and best wishes for a long and productive life in all his spheres, including physics, to Professor Yuval Neyman on his 80th birthday. His eightfold way of life is an example to all who know him or heard of him. His insistence on broadening the frame of physics theories serves as inspiration to many of us over the world. Many happy returns, Yuval. Okay, uh, I think I'll hand over the meeting to Professor Wally Grimberg and we'll start. I just want to say a couple, before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to say a couple of words of a somewhat personal nature about my own contacts with Yuval. I came to Tel Aviv in 1968 and Yuval was my host. And I had no idea of all the other things he was doing, but despite all his activities, he found room to take the visitors, including myself, on several teolim, several trips, including to Jericho and the tomb of the Machpelah. I mean, he was a very gracious host and very um, unsparing in, giving his, in, in, his, in showing hospitality and spending time with, with the visitors. Also, the, the fact that so many people are here is evidence of the broad range of interest that Yuval has and also of the affection with which people all over the world in, the, in all areas of physics uh, hold him. Personally, this, I came just for this, this visit, for Yuval's fest. It's my first visit in Israel in 20 years. So let me now introduce the first speaker, Avishai Dekel. Avi Shai was born in, in Jerusalem, educated at the Hebrew University. He's been a research fellow or a faculty member at many institutions, including Caltech. 
Yale, University of California, Santa Barbara, Weizmann Institute, the Institute Astrophysique uh, the Par in Paris, University of California, Berkeley, Santa Cruz, École Normale Normal Supérieure. His present affiliation is the Rachach Institute at the Hebrew University. He's worked in many areas of astrophysics, and his talk today is on dark matter and dark energy in the universe. Dr. Shekel. Thank you very much. Uh, I've added to the title the second inflation because Yuval is very excited about the inflation model, the first inflation, and uh, spent some time during uh, even recent years thinking about it and talking about it. Uh, so I thought inflation would be a, a nice connection to his interests, uh, but it will be a different inflation, the second inflation. So here's my eye plan for today. I'll tell you about the basic cosmological model for the benefit of those of you who are not uh, astrophysicists. Uh, um, and then I'll address what we see that leads us to, to the final conclusion that we uh, arrived at in the last few years, very dramatically. Uh, what, how much do we see? What is in addition as dark matter, which we don't really know much about, except it is gravitating and like hell. Uh, the dark energy, which is a vacuum energy uh, that is responsible for the second inflation. Uh, the curvature of space, which is another way to measure this dark energy. Um, and finally, just a few speculative words about what is the dark energy and why it's important for physics, but this will be very speculative. So let's start with the basics. Uh, we write the metric uh, of uh, Robertson Walker under the assumption of homogeneity in isotropy. Uh, and uh, there's an expansion factor which uh, governs uh, the expansion or contraction of the universe. If it's homogeneous, it must obey, must obey this universal scaling relation of expansion. Uh, and we know that this uh, metric can have three different forms depending on this function being a sine or hyperbolic sine or just the linear function in radius, of co-moving radius, you can have a closed universe with positive curvature, an open universe with a negative curvature, or a flat Euclidean universe, which also must be infinite just because we assume isotropy and we can't have edges to it. So either a finite space or infinite space. Uh, and this thing can flow homogeneously, and the only way it can flow is that such that each observer sees the Hubble law. That's the only kind of law, the linear relation between velocity and distance that allows homogeneity to remain homogeneous in time. And it doesn't matter if it's a flat universe or a closed universe, the only expansion or contraction law is universal Hubble expansion just to maintain the homogeneity before we even observe it or know about it. Uh, now what would be the destiny of universe if it's uh, expanding or contracting this way, well, here is space, a very simple space-time diagram with time here and distance here in one dimension. Uh, the expansion tells us that we all came from a Big Bang, a very highly dense uh, state of the universe at some finite time, maybe 14 billion years ago. Uh, but gravity, as we think we know, is attraction. It's, it's, it's the force of attraction. So it has to slow down the expansion. And what's allowed are only solutions in which the slope of these curves go down, slowing down, okay? Because the velocity is the slope of this curve. And it can be an expansion forever, being unbound or being bound. Namely, the expansion stops and there is a recollapse. And I will not use the Einstein equation. I will use the Newtonian uh, equivalent for it just because, again, in the audience, there are non-relativists or people who forgot or didn't use a lot their, their Einstein equation uh, basics. But the concepts can be explained in very simple terms, even with Newtonian gravity. You have kinetic energy, and you have the attraction between masses. This is uh, the potential energy uh, of, of a spherical shell, given the mass interior to the shell. And these are the competing terms of the energy. And the same thing is true for the Einstein equation. 
And the key is this parameter, omega mass, omega m, which, is, uh, which I obtained by dividing uh, the potential energy by the kinetic energy. OK? In other words, this is the mass density in the universe compared to a critical density uh, given by the Hubble constant squared and over the, the Newtonian uh, gravitational constant. So it's this mean density over the critical density which really determines, in the absence of anything else, just attraction, which determines on which solution we are. Okay, whether we are going to be bound by the excess of metal density over the critical density, there's enough gravity to stop the expansion that was given in the Big Bang and, and let it recollapse, or whether there is not enough density, whether we are under critical and omega meter is below unity. So the value of omega meter is uh, something we want to measure. It's the mean density in the units of the critical density, and if it's less than one, we are unbound. If it's more than one, we are bound. <coughs> now, in the Einstein equation, there's an intrinsic connection between this, okay, and the curvature of space. It's the sources, Einstein equation, after all, is the geometry of space related to the sources of, of energy density. And in a very simple term, you can show that the curvature of space is given by this omega meter minus one. In other words, if there's only attraction and only this part of the equation, then if you know omega m, you know the curvature. And you know that this one, the recollapsing bound universe, is also the closed universe, where the curvature is positive and strong and gravity is strong. And this one would be the open universe, and this one would be this marginal case of expansion all the way to infinity at zero velocity there is just the flat Euclidean space. And this is the intrinsic connection given by Einstein's equation. You can also learn that the acceleration is just minus omega m. In other words, in this case, since omega m is positive, there's always deceleration. There's those curves go and decelerate in time. And that's what you expect from gravity between every two bodies. So here's the open unbound universe and the closed bound universe. That's the story. Now, Einstein didn't like this idea. And he just looked for you know, Occam's razor kind of universe where everything is static and simple. And he was looking for a solution like this, where nothing happens in time. And there's no expansion, no contraction. And the way to achieve this, you need to balance, for example, what he was doing, he took this model, which was the closed model, in which without what he wanted to do, would have collapsed under gravity and put in a repulsion in terms of a cosmological constant here in the equation in his, he put it in the geometrical side of the Einstein equation and ended up with a perfect balance, not very stable one. So he himself didn't really like this one, but at least it was a solution, momentarily a solution. Now, the reason this, you see this energy term come with the same sign, but what really matters for the force is the derivative of the potential. And because this one goes like one over R, and this one goes like R squared, the derivatives have different signs. And lambda is a constant, and that's why this one is a repulsion if omega is positive. And this one is always an attraction. So don't, don't get confused by those different signs. And again, it looks just the same when you do it with the, the real Einstein's equations. So the curvature now, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence anymore between the curvature of space and, and the fate of the expansion. And you can do anything. You can get, depending on this omega lambda, the combination of omega lambda, omega m, omega lambda is just the same energy source divided by the kinetic energy. Okay, or the critical energy density. So in the same way I define this, I'm defining this one, now it's all dimensionless. This is, by the way, is the exact friedman robertson walker equation that you get from fully relativistic calculation. It looks just like this, where these things evolve in time. Now, there's no more connection. You can be closed and expanding forever if you have a lambda big enough and positive. You can be open and collapse if lambda is negative. So all, all breaks are lost. You can really have all the different combinations. Uh, and these people in Leiden met in 1920. 
in a famous meeting and, and discuss these issues, realize it's unstable. But then in 29, everybody realized that the universe is really expanding, and the whole motivation for a static universe it doesn't exist. Uh, you all know that one can look at a spectrum, typical spectrum from a star, or from galaxies, and if the galaxies are further away, the spectrum is shifted to the red, and you see uh, a higher velocity. And Einstein, which maybe before even said that this is not a very elegant solution, it's unstable, and so on, probably later said something like, you know, my biggest blunder. I don't think anybody heard Einstein, except Gamow, reporting about Einstein saying this. But uh, Anyway, let's go back to this non-cosmological concept. We don't need it, okay? The universe is expanding, or will contract, maybe. And, let's, and that's what happened since 1929 until almost the end of the last century. Uh, a big effort to try to determine where we live in this model. And the key, again, I want to remind you, is trying to measure the mass density of the universe to try to see whether we omega m is equal 1, bigger or smaller. And somehow our universe is not very far from 1. So it, the job is difficult, or was difficult, until a few years ago. And it really took almost 100 years to find out the answer, which we now know on this. So let's start with the luminous matter, because we believe that we know when we see a star by its light, luminosity, and color, and other properties, how much mass it represents by the theory of, of, of stellar evolution. So we go to a telescope. This is Keck, two Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, which now have several big telescopes. Uh, there's a very large telescope in, in Chile, the European. There are a few of those, four of those, eight-meter telescopes. Uh, you, go to, you gather a lot of photons, and you also go to space, and you can see things with high resolution above the atmosphere, like with Hubble and many other space telescopes. And you see galaxies. Okay, they have 10 to the 11 stars or so. And again, we believe we know what is the mass of each star. And we can weigh how much mass there is in a spiral, in a mixed you know, spiral elliptical galaxy. Uh, this is a nice uh, image from a new Spitzer telescope. And you see, that's what we see when we look in the infrared very well. And we see dust and, and some information about star formation. Very different picture, just to illustrate how different wavelengths really tell you a very different story about what this galaxy is about and different physical processes in it. And an amazing picture is this one. All images of the Milky Way taking in different wavelengths. So each of them represents either a different satellite, different instrument, a different telescope. And each of them tells a different story starting from the radio continuum and all the way to the gamma rays. So this is the optical picture, which by some, some uh, mislack shows mostly the dust in the galaxy. Everything is obscured. But the other things show you uh, stories. Uh, hydrogen, OK? Uh, there's atomic hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. There's the radio continuum. So 21 centimeter is a very strong tool to see neutral uh, gas. And there is hot gas coming in x-rays. So each of those is a different story, and we put them now together. There's so much rich data coming in, in, in astrophysics this day. Uh, you can really see the same object from so many different angles and learn about uh, the various physical processes. Now, you do all this, and you end up with 1% of closure. So if what you see is what you get, there is an open universe which is unbound and end of story. And this was what we used to believe, uh, astronomers used to believe until the early 70s. But then, this is a cartoon by Novikov about how you look for dark stuff, black holes or dark matter, just close your eyes. Uh, in the early 70s, the story was there's something missing, which actually came even earlier in Cluster of the Galaxy, but this is the strongest evidence for dark matter, I think. You look away from galactic center at what we call the rotation curve. And you expect a Keplerian orbit that goes like 1 over r, v squared, as you go away from the visible component if the mass is only there. 
Well, it turns out that most galaxies actually show a flat rotation curve, much higher velocities as you go away from the center. And this can be easily explained if you replace the fixed mass by a growing mass with radius, even though it does not actually reflect what you see in the stars or in the gas. And what you need to explain this flat rotation curve is m of r goes like r. Then it's really a nice constant, but you have to live with the fact that most of the mass is unseen, which I don't think is a big, a major, strange hypothesis. After all, we ourselves don't shine very much, you have to admit. Uh, Earth is not shining. Uh, planets don't shine. Black holes don't shine. You can think of many, many things that don't shine like stars. And uh, some of this is made of this kind of stuff. Maybe 10 times more. Now, there are many, many different lines of evidence now concerning uh, the dark matter. Here is a very independent one to the rotation curves, the issue of lensing. And what you see here is the center of a cluster. Each of these is a galaxy, typically elliptical galaxies. But these blue images, okay, we now believe, are just the effect of twisting and breaking one source, one galaxy, a blue galaxy, well behind this cluster by the effect of bending light uh, of, by the gravity, mostly of the dark matter in this cluster of galaxies. Either dark matter in the galactic halos or between them, just like what happened to this Smithsonian Museum when you put a lens between you or a black hole between you and, and this building, you see this, this typical, and, and this became a big industry. You can ask Danny uh, Maoz and others uh, how this is used to uh, measure the dark matter. In fact, it's used for other purposes as well. This is the opposite way of using this. What, what was used here is because of this cluster and this typical uh, feature of lensing, those two galaxies, which otherwise would be undetected because they're too faint, too far, have been amplified by the gravitational lens effect. And in this case, this cluster acts like a natural telescope, allowing you to see baby galaxies far away that you wouldn't have seen before. But for our purposes, the issue of measuring dark matter is important. Here's a third, third thing, something I myself was involved with uh, in the last century. And this is measuring streaming motions on very large scales. We are talking here about uh, 100 uh, million light years, a few hundreds. We are here, and this is a map of streaming velocities of thousands of galaxies around us towards something which we call the great attractor, as you can see here. The red colors indicate a negative divergence, namely contraction. And we invented this method to analyze these and end up with a density map. Okay, so this is a density map in two-dimensional plane, which we call the supergalactic plane, in which we are here in the middle. The great attractor is here. It's an over density of a factor of a few but it's huge, and that's why it's so attractive. There's another attractor here called Pesos Pisces. There's the coma, and there's a repeller, namely a big void, but all together giving us the velocity we measure uh, compared to the macro background of 600 kilometers per second. But this is a map of the dark matter distribution, not the light, necessarily. It's what gives you the attraction the, or the velocities we observe. You do all these games together on different scales. Again, you sum it up, and you get omega meter of 0.3. So the good news is that this is 30 times higher than the luminous matter. So you learn something exciting. Most of the matter in the universe, by a factor of 30, is dark, is non-luminous. It just acts gravitationally like everything else. Uh, it attracts, but we don't know what it is. Uh, the bad news, if you want, this is still shy by a factor of three from closing the universe. And we learn now that we've done all these things with many different ways, that this is a sure thing. You know, we're far from closure by the dark matter. And if this was the end of the story, again, the universe was still unbound and infinite, even though there's this exciting dark matter. What is this dark matter, by the way? What is it made of? Well, you would think it might be baryonic, in the sense that the Earth is dark, or black holes, the end of 
lives of stars, but then some other arguments come in, in particular what you learn from the big bang nucleosynthesis in the first three minutes in the universe, and you learn the baryons, the normal matter of protons and, and neutrons cannot close the universe, cannot be more than four or five percent. Because you observe the deuterium abundance, helium abundance, and they tell you the story in connection to the first, to the quite safe nuclear physics of the first few minutes. Uh, so this is not something, and, and then there are other lines of argument from absorption lines to quasars, and, and mostly from the macro background, which I'll, I'll talk about at the end. We really know baryons cannot do much. So there can be a, fact, you know, a factor of 4% baryonic dark matter of this sort, but this is not the 30% we are forced to, to assume. So most of us think it's some particles, maybe some supersymmetric particles that will be detected eventually, you know, neutralinos, photinos, these are supersymmetric particles, or axions, another story uh, that particle physics invent for us. All these dense supersymmetric particles you can't see, that's what drove me to drink, but now I can see them. Well, hopefully, CERN will tell us in a couple of years uh, something about this. Maybe it will detect the supersymmetric uh, uh, smallest particle. Maybe not. Maybe we have to live with the problem for a long time. There's a big effort trying to measure these dark matter particles, and I'm sure eventually they will be detected. It's tough because gravity we know about. This doesn't tell us what the particle is. What's left is weak interaction, which is weak, hard to detect, and make life very hard. So this was the story. It ended only recently with the number, but the knowledge about dark matter was known since actually 1968, and then the early 70s. But with the first rotation curve, and then Zwicky talked about clusters already in the 40s or 50s. Uh, we learned that it's 0.3 plus minus something small only very recently, you know, in this, in this century. But in the last five, six, seven years, this was the big surprise that brings us back, back to Einstein cosmological constant. And the idea was very naive. You know, two groups said, let's do a big effort and try to measure the rate of deceleration of the universe under the gravity of attraction. And they set in the early 90s to do this independently, two different groups. And I don't know why this Darth Vader is stuck. Very, per very persistent guy. Have you seen already uh, Star Wars 3? Just appeared last week, right? Not, is it, does it show in Israel? Saturday. Saturday in Israel? Should all go. Uh, anyway, uh, well, you look back far away because you have big telescopes, a lot of photons, high resolution. You can identify sources very far away. You look back in time because of light travel is the speed of light. And you see things like this from the space telescope. Uh, you see uh, next to these very big galaxies, which are nearby galaxies, you see those very little smudges which are very distant galaxies at distances of four or a few billion light years. So the way they looked very early. This is an example of very early galaxies. They look very different. They show signs of collisions. They're blue. They're making stars. They're baby galaxies. Uh, and you know, because you have high resolution going to space, you can see these baby galaxies. And you can, you can notice the details and find items in them. And in particular, you find a standard candle. So it turns out that some typical supernova called type 1A is a very nice standard candle in the sense that on it, we know what the intrinsic luminosity is. So just like if you have a, a lamp with, with a known power and you put it at far away and you see the flux, you know the distance by one of our squared, that's the same story almost with some fine tuning. Uh, so, the last other thing is that those supernovae, once they explode overnight, and some observers here can tell you about this, they show up overnight, but billion times brighter, and they become as bright as the whole galaxy or as the center of the galaxy. 
which means you can not only know what is the power written on them intrinsically, you can see them very far away. So you can see them deep into back in time, into the early times. And they can serve to tell you what was the rate of expansion, like the Hubble constant, at early times, a few billion years ago. And that's what you want to compare to today's expansion rate to tell the deceleration rate. So here is the calibration at small distances. Uh, you measure uh, the velocity by the redshift, and you find, again, what Hubble found uh, almost 100 years ago, that the universe is expanding linearly with the Hubble rate, of a given Hubble rate. And then you go and look for supernovae far away. And this is the first bunch that was uh, by one of those groups that was published in 1998, showing the big surprise. Now, I'm, I'm trying to make it more simple than re this really is, but just to make the point very, very clear. You see that all the points lie above this yellow line, which would have been a natural thing. In fact, if there was a deceleration, you would have expected the points to lie below this line. You would expect it at a given distance to have higher velocities at early times. And this will give you a sign of deceleration. But in fact, what you see is that the best fit slope, if you look at it this way, have a lower velocity at early times. The Hubble expansion rate, which is the slope of this line, is going up in time, completely opposite to what attractive gravity would have told you. The universe is really accelerating. This was really came by some luck by those two groups at the same time. And I have the picture of the PIs of those two groups. Uh, Gershon Goldhaber, who was just quoted here, was part of this group. Uh, of, of Sol Perlmutter in Berkeley, and Brian Schmidt is in Australia, but the group again is in Harvard, Berkeley. Basic American with some uh, co-eyes elsewhere. I guess this is the guy, this is the guy who's going to get the Nobel Prize eventually, right? Uh, for this one. Uh, same result, basically, which just becomes stronger in time. Uh, how do we explain this? We go back to Einstein, we say, this was a great idea, this cosmological constant, uh, because now we have acceleration. The curve is going up. This is the inflation. It's exp you know, expanding uh, probably exponentially. And the way to get this is to think about something repulsive. And something repulsive exists mathematically as the cosmological constant term to Einstein's equation. It adds, as we say, to the curvature and to the acceleration. And again, now we don't have any constraints. The universe can be closed and expanding forever and vice versa. And all these possible things can happen. This is a recent confirmation that what we see in this supernovae is just not just some artifact of lake dust. If you think if the universe is full of dust, which abs absorbed the light in some way, you can get misled by this exercise of measuring distance from a standard candle and really think wrongly that objects become faint in the wrong rate with distance just because it's full of dust. And then if you plot the distance compared to an empty universe uh, compared to this line here, this tells you about acceleration. Uh, and you would expect that something like this to go and become worse and worse if this effect is important of dust the artificial dust. But remember, we think that the universe, which now expands exponentially under cosmological constant, no matter what the model is, always started decelerating by the effects of uh, attraction. So if we go back in time enough, we should find this deceleration phase of the early universe. And this is what's seen right here. This point at a redshift of about 0.5, 1.5, is, well, one and a half sigma below the line and tells you that you see the acceleration. So more of this should be seen, and a special satellite called SNAP is planned to actually do this job. But there are first signs that probably we see something that really tells us 
about universal behavior like this and not some other artifact. Now, one should still worry about systematics and, and there's a lot of work trying to understand and really, you know, you have to convince yourself that those supernovae you see different redshifts are the same objects and they are stone candles. And there are arguments I won't go into this. It looks pretty convincing at the two, three sigma level. And that's the kind of confidence you should take home with you about this expanding universe. So let's put things in perspective and explain. Omega matter here of attraction, omega lambda here of the vacuum repulsion. Uh, the model tell you first, if you don't have a cosmological constant, if it's zero, you can be unbound or bound depending on whether omega m is below, below or above unity, as we said earlier on. Uh, but then, this is the line which, you, if you have to be forced to go away from a zero cosmological constant, that you would choose from elegancy arguments. It's the flat universe, the Euclidean one, in which omega m plus omega lambda is just unity. Curvature uh, is zero. So this is, this is the friedman robertson walker equation for zero curvature. Uh, a flat universe is exactly this line. Above it, you are closed, finite universe, and here below it, you're an open, infinite universe. And finally, the line describing zero acceleration, namely, you decelerate when you're below here. If lambda is zero, you always decelerate. But if you are high above here with positive cosmological constant, you are accelerating. And in the early universe, you start somewhere near here, no matter what. But then, depending on where you start, you would evolve away from it. In particular, if you are in a flat universe, you would go this way if you are just a little bit positive with cosmological constant. And eventually, you go into the phase where you enter the acceleration phase. You start decelerating, as we said, under gravity attracting, and then you will accelerate. What do we know observationally? A summary of the dark matter story give you 0.3 plus minus. This is a two sigma region. So you know that you can exclude this naive thing we always loved, this Einstein, the Sitter universe where it's flat and marginally bound. Okay? You have to be in this region, maybe. But this excludes some of the possibilities. But you can be, still be open and bound or unbound. Or you can be closed, etc. So you don't know much about geometry, and you don't know much about the fate. You just limit yourself to one, two, three, four of the six possibilities. This is a supernova story, again, two sigma kind of crude limits, now telling you that with some good statistics, you have a positive cosmological, not very convincing, because at, at the two, two and a half sigma level, you could be very unbound with a zero cosmological constant. So this, by itself, was very exciting, but not, you know, earth-shaking, confident result. But indicating that you are somewhere here, omega m point three, omega lambda above point five, and below unity. Uh, this is the quantitative conclusion that you can derive from these two constraints, knowing omega m and the supernova measurements, you know that you are at 70% of dark energy. It's most of the energy density. Okay, it's very close to giving you a flat universe. 0.7 plus the 0.3 from dark matter is a round unity, is what you need for the critical density. And this repulsion is really taking over in the last few billion years uh, and is really leading to this second inflation. And finally, in with this test, I want to tell you about another way, which is independent of measuring lambda, which gives us the stronger confidence. And this is, again, trying to measure something else, trying to measure the curvature of, of space. And you, again, you can be closed or flat or open, and you try to determine this. And you use a similar trick to what you did with the standard candle. You use a standard rod. And again, if you have a different curvature, to space, but you have a rod which you know its size, and you know its distance from you, you can compute the angle of sight, the edges of this rod, given the curvature. 
and flat geometry give you something, and curved geometry give you a bigger or smaller depending on the sign of the curvature. That's the trick. You just need a, stand a standard rod, which you can see very far away, and nature provides you with a fantastic rod like this as far as you can think, you know, almost 14 billion years ago. And that's the cosmic background back radiation, which has these fluctuations in it with intrinsic size, which we think we know theoretically from a theoretical cosmology. And this really happened or orbited the last time when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old, that's, that's all. And it really traveled for uh, 14 billion years until it reaches us, the famous macro background. Uh, how much time do I have? I want to know how much, to how much details I want to go into here. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, a few words about the macro background for those of you who are not fully familiar with it. Uh, in this space-time diagram, it's like looking into uh, a cloud layer and seeing only the last scattering surface from it. We look back in time, and when the universe was this old, and its temperature was about 4,000 years, 4,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, it switched from an ionized universe to a neutral hydrogen universe, and this really made it turn from an opaque, non-transparent universe in which the photons are all scattered very efficiently, Thompson scattering on free electrons, into free agents, you know, moving freely from this last scattering surface to us in a transparent universe, because the electrons disappeared from the game, and the Thompson scattering for the photons became many orders of magnitude lower. This is the surface, and uh, this surface has on its fluctuations, which are the seeds of us, of galaxies that form all the structure of this order, one in 100,000, fluctuations in density and therefore in temperature, in the, in, in the three degree uh, temperature we see. But for us, what's relevant for this measure of curvature and having a standard rod is that there is a scale, a characteristic scale in the last category of surface which we think we know what it is. And that's the horizon of the universe, the causal universe at that time, which is roughly corresponding to 100 uh, co-moving megaparsecs today, the size of, uh, like the picture of, of the flows I showed you earlier. This is the kind of, of, of size of a typical uh, scale on the last scattering surface. You know, the horizon is the, really the only scale in cosmology. So if, if it's frozen at a given time and then you see it, you should know what the scale is. Uh, another way to see the same thing is you put yourself here in space and in time, and this is your past li light cone. This is the Big Bang singularity and this is the horizon. You cannot see further away because then you have to, fa to move faster than light to be observed, so you see only a finite part of, of much bigger universe, maybe infinite. Uh, this is the last scattering surface, and again, from here, your horizon, which is this little thing, is this 100 co-moving megaparsecs. That's the size that's built in into your last scattering picture. Well, you know the macro background has this uh, black body perfect power, which confirms what we know about this. Uh, so during the years, starting from the three degree background looking like this, uh, measurements started giving us the dipole motion at the level of 10 to minus three fluctuations. Then Kobe in 92 showed the fluctuations, but not with high resolution. And eventually recently, WMAP with high enough resolution to actually measure the angular power spectrum or the typical shape and size of those patches here, which are the standard we expect to be the horizon size at last scattering. And this is the impressive picture from, from Kobe, which tell us so many things. But this was even before Kobe. A satellite, a balloon that NASA flew, hmm? before WMS, sorry. A balloon called Boomerang, which was uh, flown at the edge of Antarctica, you know, the wind pattern in Antarctica, give it a three-week orbit, usually, and hopefully, if you're lucky, it comes back to where you started, and you can collect 
the camera and the telescope. And, and this happens. Now, this is computer simulation of what you would expect if you live in a flat universe, a positive curve or negatively curved universe, the patches become bigger or smaller depending on, on the curvature, as we illustrated before. And this is the actual measurement of boomerang before WMAP, uh, but only of a small patch of the sky. WMAP gave us the whole picture of the whole sky, much more statistics. But right from here, I think with no further calculation, you can imagine what the result is that this would be the selected picture in terms of the size of the fluctuation patches. These are too big, these are too small. The universe is close to flat. And indeed, you do this, and as a function of the spherical harmonic L, okay, so angle go this way, and harmonic goes this way, this will be the quadrupole, dipole, quadrupole, etc. Uh, theoretically, you predict this, and you see Kobe uh, W map measurements are those error bars showing this nice power spectrum. The power spectrum is defined this way. You just Fourier transform your fluctuations in temperature as a function of the two angles, theta and phi, and you take this uh, coefficients here and you define a power spectrum. And then you can tell that the root mean square fluctuation. Oh, sorry, uh, the uh, mean square fluctuation has to do with those coefficients, and that's what's plotted here. So it's an angular power spectrum uh, with the harmonic L. A peak is expected at around 200 L. It's about one degree. And these are different acoustic peaks. It turns out that each of those is a story on its own. It's sensitive to a different physical process uh, in this early universe. In particular, the position of this peak and this, oh my goodness. Bill Gates doesn't like us. Ah. So, what do we do next? You know this happened to Bill Gates himself once? Serves him right. Hmm? <laughs> Serves him right. <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, the position of the peak, okay, is really telling you uh, whether, if this is around 200, that's a flat universe, and it would have been at smaller angle or bigger angles if it was a closed universe like this, and it would have been at 300, 400 if it was an open universe. The fact that it's around 200 really tells us the story, and what you learn is that within the horizon, within what you can actually measure, you don't notice the curvature, unlike this case. Okay? And the universe may still be open or closed, but very, very big, much bigger than your horizon. And that's the lesson from this. Uh, by the way, why don't we see the whole? OK. So here comes the story of where the macro constraints are, you're really at two sigma confined to around the flat Euclidean space. But as I said, because it's around this, we probably will never know. If it was really flat, we will never know that. Because it will always, the measurement will be a plus minus some epsilon, and it may still be bound or unbound. But look how lucky we are here. Okay? This region coincides with the other at the same place. That's really a miracle, right? Imagine what would have happened if, the, if this line would have been here. I don't know. So first, we do something right, probably. 
And what we see here from these three completely independent measurements, every two of which tell you the same story. So you can use supernovae and CMB, cosmic microwave background. You can use supernovae and dark matter, or mass. Or dark matter and CMB, each two give you the answer. It's the same answer. That's why we are so excited about this, and that's why we believe we are seeing something real. And in fact, you can use other measurements, like the age of the universe, coming from the Hubble constant, tell you also some story about this that is consistent. Uh, the fluctuation growth rate, there are at least two or three others which I can elaborate on, but I won't. So this is a pretty confident result, uh, just to illustrate that uh, those other uh, peaks will tell us in the future years, more and more about the universe. And I'll just cut things short here, if I could. Uh, and I want to mention polarization. Let me skip all this. This is typical numbers that come out from WMAP, uh, of which we really learn pretty much about many things, okay? uh, like the neutrino mass upper limit come from the same many peaks in the CMB, uh, the variance to photon is really the entropy of the universe comes in, uh, the amplitude of fluctuations, very important for study of uh, large scale structure in the universe, uh, the initial power spectrum of those fluctuations generated in the inflation and so on. So just to summarize what we know about the universe here, before I make some comments about the dark energy, is the following. The luminous matter was only 1%. The dark baryonic matter added about 4% to a total of 5 But then most of dark matter, 25%, is probably supersymmetric exotic particles. Uh, and then this dark energy that comes in, the repulsive part, is 70%, adding up together to um, this second inflation of the universe uh, by this vacuum energy or vacuum geometry. And we still don't know whether this expansion will go on forever or not, depending on whether this is just a simple cosmological constant or something else. And the CMB measurement tell you that the Euclidean geometry in the observable volume tells you that the universe is just very, very big, much bigger than the horizon scale. So let me conclude with just a few speculative co uh, comments about what this dark energy uh, is. Okay? Uh, this movie, hopefully, first want to sober us up. What's happened on our scale, where galaxies form, is attraction. Lambda doesn't have much to say about the fact that we are here in the direct right way, and what we do now in cosmology, which is mostly try to understand galaxy formation, has to do with gravity, in the following sense. Okay? You see an expanding patch of the universe, which is really bound. Uh, you see dark matter, this is all dark matter, dark matter halos forming in a pancake like this, and then streaming and merging in a constant, continuous merging process, only gravitational, to build dark matter halos of an individual galaxy, which is the final product of this uh, uh, 100 million particle simulation run on a supercomputer. And this is what really attracts most of the interest in cosmology these days, try to understand the process of how galaxies form. But what I want to say here is that this is really Newtonian gravity on top of an expanding universe, relativistic expanding universe. You don't need uh, and, and the, the role, in fact, if the cosmological concept was bigger, this couldn't have happened. And this is one of the anthropic arguments that people give, that the cosmological constant cannot be much bigger or much smaller than it really is today, to allow a proper sequence of formation of galaxies, stars, and people in this universe at the rate they form. Uh, but that's, uh, I'm not sure it's, it's physics. One lesson from this 
Second inflation is that our fate is very unpleasant. It's the lonely, uh, uh, the lonely fate. If the universe was expanding like a Paolo without its inflation, then here is a patch expanding in time, and here is the horizon scale, the region which allows us to see things and to interact with the causal horizon, which goes like T. So there are two Paolos, and in fact, the horizon in this case contains more mass in it as time passes by. You become more and more causal. You start chaotic, but you, you, you become more causal. This is a friendly destiny. But with the inflation universe, you grow so fast. Okay? Most of the universe runs away faster than the speed of light compared to you. You cannot measure it, of course. You can measure things only inside this horizon. But you become lonelier and lonelier. You know, this galaxy sees many neighbors here and very few neighbors here. Eventually, it will be all alone. No more stars, no, no more attraction. No, the simulation I showed you won't work. You will see no more galaxy formation, no more star formation, and everything will, will die and become you know, cold and dead. Of course, you can have disasters much before that. I want to point out a change of interpretation between Einstein and the present ray. This is the actual Einstein equation, the Einstein tensor versus the, the stress energy tensor, which is the sources. Einstein put his cosmological constant right here, multiplying the metric. And this is like it's a property of, of space, space-time. We today put it here. We think of it as an energy source, and we call it a dark energy. Okay, it's, it's, it's believed to be here. And that's the com part of this is because, unlike Einstein, we like quantum gravity, uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, I think it was uh, Zeldovich who first came up with this idea, or maybe actually people correct me, and it was probably earlier, but he made a big deal out of it. The idea that in the quantum world, you can have a source of energy to the vacuum itself in terms of virtual pairs of particles that are formed, appear, particle and particle disappear, you know, at random in space, like this, and he, Zeldovich made a nice calculation of how much energy density this will give you. Well, it ended up with too much energy uh, by a big, big factor. So this simple idea, as is, doesn't work, but still there's a concept that you can fill the vacuum with some energy. Uh, and here's just a list of speculative ideas, and I'm sure there are more of what this dark energy or vacuum energy could be. This quantum fluctuations of virtual pair are probably too much. String theory gives you some example again, probably too much, at least as far as I heard so far. But some landscape new ideas have some solution with small lambda. People think about extra dimensions that give you additional terms to answer equation, which look like a solar constant. Uh, maybe it's not vacuum at all, but some other type uh, that varies in time. And uh, let me just show you this one before last, I think, Sorry, slide. Uh, the way, the funny way this energy works, write this energy equation where the rest frame, the rest energy in the expanding universe uh, is just the work that's being done by this expansion, the PDV work. Uh, if you use this equation and you assume that you have a constant energy density, this is what lambda is, you get a negative pressure. It's a very funny situation which we're not used to in everyday life. Uh, just from here you get that the, the energy, if this is constant, you can take it out and then it, the pressure is negative. And you can generalize this. And instead of this minus one here, write an equation of state with, a, with some w here. This w can be a function of space or a function of time and uh, sometimes called quintessence model. And we try to put constraints on this. If W is minus 1, it's the simple Einstein lambda. But as long as W is less than minus a third, you have an accelerating universe the way we observe it. So this is actually the measurements. Uh, here is the same omega m uh, W now. And this would be a lambda of minus 1 cosmological constant. This would be uh, acceleration below minus a third. And W map, the same funny peaks, give you already a constraint 
of below minus 0.8. So we are closing in on something that looks like Einstein lambda, which may tell us the universe will eventually uh, be expanding forever. So let me just summarize with this. We have a nearly flat universe, omega total of around 1 to 2 percent. All these components, so it's sort of a very elegant universe. It's what it is. And we really want to understand why. If we are with a lambda term, if this is really a cosmological constant, then it's going to expand forever. But we should be open to, to other possibilities for this dark energy. Uh, I think it's very clear that the dark energy may be the clue to quantum gravity in one way or another. Uh, and I'll end up with this uh, optimistic note right here. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, Shmuel? Is the energy eventually unbind galaxy clusters on system? No, no. I don't think it has any effect on this already bound systems. It will prevent new systems on bigger scales from ever collapsing. So linear fluctuations are frozen out. We call it the freeze out. If they belong to a huge galaxy cluster, how do we know what is the bound thing that we are well, going to? Well, most likely what we see today is the end of the story because we already entered this inflation phase. Okay? So our local group will not grow much. Okay? And the vehicle cluster will not grow much. We are pretty much at the end of the story. What's happened from now on is a kind of entering a freeze out phase. Yes. I have two questions. One is uh, related to what you said that uh, in your picture uh, you somehow suggested that the inflection point, because if, if there was acceleration before and acceleration, sure. so there's an inflection point. It must have some meaning. Are we inside? Uh, are no, no, it happened about three or four billion years ago. Three or four billion years ago? Mm. About a third of the age of the universe back to the Big Bang. Okay. We are already inflating. There was another inflation before. That's the inflation I started with that you will like so much uh, in the very, very universe came mostly to explain other problem in, and uh, I'm sure other people may, are you going to discuss inflation a little bit? No. But that's, that's the very early universe inflation which behaves just the same way due to some phase transition that looks like a cosmological constant which appeared and disappeared in a fraction of a second. That's another thing that bothered me that uh, in all this Einstein's equations, which are linear, there it's linear dependent between curvature and energy momentum tensor. This is linear. And you, you never suggest that it can be not true for some densities. Or... No, you need some phase. Well, for the first iteration, you need some phase transition that will look I like. Uh, alluded to changing Einstein's Lagrangian. Maybe there is some non linear part. Well, maybe, maybe we should... Uh, this is one of the possible solutions, yeah. So let's have one more question, then we'll go on to the next speaker. Yes. Neutrinos believed to be, for several years, a possibility, but no longer. From this W map measurements and other measurements, we know that the mass of the neutrino even though non-zero possibly is below a limit that will make it interesting. Because you know, we know how many neutrinos there should be. At some point there was equal numbers of neutrinos and, and other species. So you know it cannot be... Hmm? So what proportion of the 100% of the, of, the, uh, of the mass of the universe is neutrinos? Neutrinos less than 1%. And uh, electrons are totally negligible? Electrons are completely negligible, yeah, because you know they are much slower than the baryons. So it's a factor of two thousand from the baryons, from the protons and neutrons, which is by themselves are four percent. So it's point four, well, no, thousand less than. Uh, Tao Ching, uh, Tao Ching the uh, ratio of the dark matter, dark energy, uh, with the scale. Well, the dark energy does not cluster, and the dark matter does cluster by gravity. Okay, so in this room we are overwhelmed by the matter density, and that's true. Everything within galaxies and even within clusters of galaxies is dominated by dark matter. 
You have to go outside of galaxies far away to start being dominated by the repulsion of the, of the vacuum. Let, let me ask a question. Do you ever see the rotation curves go down, or they go out flat forever? There's and no it, indication for significant going down. It goes down a little bit, but, but in, ex in consistency with what we think it should be. So there's no galaxy where you see a dropping rotation curve. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, in this sense, it's all consistent with this concept of, of dark matter. Okay. I think we'd better go on to the next speaker.